Good day, folks. It's DIY Guy123 here. Today I'm bringing you another do it yourself video. This one's on stove repair. And this stove I purchased and I was told it worked fine. And when I got it home, um, I turned the bake, uh, turned the broil on, and the broil element heats right up fast, the, the top element on the inside. But when I turned the bake setting on, it, uh, it, the bake element came on for just a moment, enough to warm it up. In fact, I had a little bit of uh, water on my finger and I just, just ever so, just ever so quickly touched the element and it sizzled. So I'm like, yep, the bake element's working, but it wouldn't come up to temperature. The preheat light stayed on and on and on and on for an eternity. And when I checked, it really wasn't heating up anymore. Well, okay, so is it a bad element or is it something else? Is, uh, is the... Is the element bad? Is the computer not telling the element? Not computer is a pretty strong word, but are the relays and the solid state stuff in there not telling the element to come on? Is there some sensor not telling the solid state circuitry to come on? Well, let's take a look. So I've got, it's plugged in right now. I am gonna be careful that I don't put my fingers into things where they shouldn't be. But one of the things that can go wrong is this is the temperature sensor right here. And if it fails, it can tell the computer, hey, it's already 350 degrees. And you've got the, the computer says, I've already, I'm supposed to get 350 degrees. So it shuts the bake element off because it doesn't want to get temperature too hot. And so if your sensor's bad, it could be telling even at like, you know, cold right now, it could be telling um, you that it's warm when it's really not. Well, in the back of uh, most stoves, there's a little plastic pouch and inside the pouch are the instructions. And the instructions just happen to talk about the uh, RTD. I don't know what that stands for, resistance something maybe. But anyway, this is the resistance of the temperature uh, sensor. And so at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it should be at 1000 ohms. Right now, it's about 44 degrees Fahrenheit or seven degrees Celsius in this location. I'm in a in an outside garage, so it's not very warm out here. And so according to this, I should have between 1,000 and 1,091 ohms. I'd say uh, closer to 1,000, let's call it 1,020. So let's shoot for that. So I've got my ohm meter here and I've disconnected the range sensor now, or the oven sensor now. I would encourage you to unplug your stove. I did not do that, but certainly I would encourage you to unplug the stove because I'm taking a, I guess, a risk by fiddling with the wiring with it unplugged. But, uh, well, I'm not too worried about it. So, my leads, I put one in there and one in there. Remember, I was looking for 1,020-ish ohms. Well, that was, there's 1,047, so, you know, maybe I'm just guessing the temperature wrong in here. Maybe it's warmer than I thought, but we're within the range from 1,000 to 1,090. So the temperature sensor, at least at this temperature, is good. Now, not to say that it can't be out of calibration or out of whack when you're at 350 or 450, but at least in, in this temperature, um, we're good. So I'll, I'll rule that out as a reason why the burner is not coming on. Okay, second thing is, I'm going to turn it to, uh, I'm going to turn bake on right now. So to do that, press the bake button and there's 350. And if I wait a sec, you'll hear a click. Right. The oven light comes on and the preheat light, com light comes on. Well, the preheat is basically this controller telling you that it's not up to temperature yet. The oven light uh, comes on and um, whenever this controller thinks the bake element is on and the oven light may blink on and off uh, as the bake element turns on and off. Hmm, is that right? That might be right. And when the preheat light goes out, that's when you're you know, able to start your cooking at the target temperature. Okay, so now that that's now that we think the bake element's on, and it should be on solid, because, because uh, you know, I just turned it on from cold, I'm going to put my meter on 
an AC voltage scale and I'll connect one of my leads here and I will connect I'll show you all this in a sec so I have my leads connected to my AC voltmeter okay so right now I have the red lead of my voltmeter connected to this green wire which connects to one terminal of the bake element the other terminal out of my or the other lead out of my meter the black one connects to the yellow alligator clip lead which goes on to the yellow terminal of the bake element right there so there should be 240 volts across there and there's not if there was 240 volts across there and it's not heating up you know the bake elements bad but in this case I have no reason to think the bake elements bad I'm suggesting that the controller is not telling basically the bake element to turn on the controller is not applying voltage so if you want to kind of uh, test your knowledge on how this is working you could take those leads from down there and put them on the broil element leads right here the orange and the blue your colors might be different but basically you'll see two large terminals coming out two-thirds of the way up the stove and that's the broil element when you turn it on broil you should see 240 volts there I've already done that and I know that it works so I've proved my leads and my voltmeter and my knowledge and all that so what's the problem well almost always if your elements good and your uh, temperature sensor is good it's this control board now if you look at the colors of the leads to the bake element orange and yellow and you look at the colors of the leads to the broil element orange and blue what do we notice the orange ones are the same color and in fact in this wire harness those orange ones are connected together so they are connected together and these wires are the ones that basically control the voltage to the bake and broil element well since my problem is with the bake element and the orange lead i'm going to chase i'm sorry the yellow lead i'm going to chase that all the way up all the way up to the yellow lead here and i'll give you a little a little zoom into that circuit board right there you can see the orange lead at the top of the screen and then the blue lead is right below that now there are two relays there these white boxes and I don't know what either of them do but given that I heard a relay click in when I turned the uh, right here when I turned the stove on it's a safe bet that uh, those relays are, re are controlling the heavy current from the uh, bake element now I'm gonna take a guess that the top relay controls the bake element and the bottom relay controls the broil element I don't know if that's true so if you know please comment but I just got looking for things that might be melted or burnt I didn't really know what to look for but this is a plastic cover right here I wouldn't touch those leads this is a plastic cover but when I, I noticed I'm gonna show you the meter Watch when I touch this right here. There. I touched it and it's 244. Now it won't fail. When that heats up, that's going to fail. But anyway, when I touched that relay, I could hear like a frying sound. And I'm certain that the solder connection in that relay is faulty or there's something wrong with this relay. What may have happened is the solder, you know, liquefied because it was arcing and now it with because I was holding it in it kind of bonded together when the solder cooled of a poor contact while electricity was flowing through it contact was maintained but I just shut the stove off and turned it back on again so turn the oven back on at 350 watch this meter when I press here see that 240 and I'll let go there it goes pressing 240 there it goes. So I'm very, and I'll do it on this one, you won't see that happen. Pushing, pushing, doesn't change, but push this top one, 240. Oh, wait a sec. See that meter fluctuating there? So what we've proven is that when that relay is flexed a little bit, or the board is flexed, or both, 240 volts is applied to the bake element. So I'm confident that that is the problem. So I'm going to be taking this apart. There's uh, the one, two, three, four screws. You'll take the control board out. You're going to have to disconnect this line right here. This is a big connector with a bunch of uh, 
of uh, wires that feed the control board and then these wires right here disconnect them i'd always recommend you take a photograph or a couple of photographs to know how to put things back together and certainly unplug the power before you do any um... to get this out you want to be careful because this is the display on one side it's a double circuit board there's one circuit board here and then another one right behind it and they're connected with these flimsy little wires so what you're going to do is you're going to try and take this circuit board and hinge it open like that well that's going to take a bit of care there are these little little uh, bumps right here molded into the plastic there and there there and there and the same thing on the bottom I'm gonna try and pry the board out like this without cracking the plastic just as you see right there watch this you need a nice thin screwdriver for this job and you need to get them all free I think that's all of them on this top side. Yeah, and now I'm gonna get them all free here. And of course I have my thumb there. I don't wanna be pulling on these components. You know, they're pretty, I wouldn't say fragile so much as uh, we've already seen what happens when they don't wanna have good solder connections. I'm gonna get a knife. There's that one. Once you get one, it's probably easier to get the next one. Next one. Okay, so there was a little lip right here that I had to get past. Once I'm past, that bends up there really easily. Okay, so I've given this a decent look over, and normally when there's a cold solder joint that is, you know, make or break connection when you push on a circuit board, you can see stuff going on in there. You can see a trace moving. You can see... Uh, you know, a wire moving or a trace lifting. I don't see any of that. These solder joints all look good. Doesn't mean that they are, so I am gonna go over them, but I'm doubtful that this is gonna resolve the problem. I suspect what'll end up happening is I'll need to remove and uh, replace that relay. This is not the best soldering iron for doing this kind of work. Um, it's kind of just too big. And, uh, but anyway, we'll make it work. It's important when you're working with traces like this that you uh, you definitely don't want to solder anything that shouldn't have been touching. What I mean by that is you don't want to put a blob of solder somewhere that there wasn't a blob before, shorting out two traces. So I'm adding a bit of solder there. Okay, so that's the relay that was the problem. Uh, okay, so I'm going to plug that in and try it and see what happens. Hopefully we don't start a fire here. You may see while I'm handling this, I try not to bend these boards back and forth because these little wires are fragile. So once I pick this angle, I'm not going to collapse that or adjust that angle between these two circuit boards until the project's all done and this goes back into that housing. So uh, I've got a basic uh, $8 soldering iron here and I'm using some solder braid, wicking braid. I'll give you a little zoom in to show you what it looks like. Just exactly what it sounds like, copper braid. And this will suck up any liquefied solder that it gets in contact with. Now I've seen people on YouTube do similar types of repairs before. And if you don't have braid, really, uh, there's another type of tool you can use. It's called a solder sucker. Looks like a soldering iron and it gets hot, but there's a bulb on it. When you squeeze the bulb, air goes out. So you'd squeeze the bulb, hold it on, liquefy the solder, and then let go of the bulb and it, it will suck up the solder. I don't have one of those. This will work just fine. I've seen other people um, that don't have either this or the solder sucker and uh, they they actually liquefy the joints while pulling on the component and they keep doing that for all of the, like that's fine if you only have two leads from the component, but they'll keep doing that for all, you know, in this case there are eight leads and it will work, it's time consuming, but what you end up doing is you overheat the board in, in a lot of cases and you can lift the traces off of the board and that's a, you just don't want to do that. Now, I don't fault anyone for doing exactly that. Hey, you do what you have to with the tools you've got. So uh, I applaud people for trying to help themselves. And um, hopefully you'll be able to see. I'm, I'm, yeah, that's, I was just wondering if that soldering iron had enough heat to actually wick the solder away. In this case, it's an underpowered soldering iron. So I may be repeating this test with the... Uh, the bigger soldering iron I showed you earlier. 
Yeah, I'm taking too long to heat up that solder. Put some of the wick extending past the thing you're trying to heat up. And that way, after you get the solder liquefied, you can drag the braid past it and it will suck up even more solder. Now, I need the heavier iron. This one's just not, this is only 25 watts and you need more than that. So we've got our 100 watt soldering iron and it's a little overkill, but the 25 watt one wasn't doing it. My soldering iron on, I'm gonna heat up the terminal. And after I see solder start to liquefy, I just see it there now, I'm gonna draw that copper past it. It's much easier if someone holds the circuit board and prevents it from moving. And I don't wanna be heating the board up at any one place too long. So I'll keep moving. And then I cut off the braid that's full of solder and use clean braid. So let's try this again. If you get all the solder off, the, uh, the relay will come out much easier. as the wick gets full of solder it doesn't want to pick up new solder so after having an assistant hold the circuit board i could actually apply a bit of force with the soldering iron while i'm de-wicking or desoldering with the wick and look at this comes right out in your hand okay so curiosity got to me and i thought I wonder what's inside that relay that could be causing the problem it's often just a carbon buildup inside relays. So basically I took it apart and uh, look, you can even see the, the carbon from the arcing in there. If you look, this, this relay that my fingernail's touching, right, this part that my fingernail's touching, the center part, that's what goes back and forth. And it's gonna be pretty hard to do this with, uh, oh yeah, there we go. See how this piece can move back and forth? Well, there was heavy carbon between the part that moves right here in the center and this contact to the left if i had cleaned that up with some emery cloth you know it could have it could have lasted a while longer and um but i can i can just see that it was pitted and so on so for the eight bucks and the you know hour whatever 10 minutes it took to change it i'm glad i changed it just wanted to point out that's what the failure was through the magic of Video editing, are you ready for it? Three, two, one. Hey, look at this. Hey, look at this, we got another one here. Look at this. Brand new from the store, $7.65. This is from my local electronics shop. And the font is a little different color, it's a little lighter, but it's OZSS12LF, same thing. Now what you wanna make sure when you buy a replacement part, number's the same and most importantly, well, also important is the pinout's the same. So we're gonna take our faulty one, put it aside, take our new one. So I'm lining up the holes for my new one. Oh, dumb, stupid, stupid luck. That might help. And you wanna push this component down all the way to the board to give the board maximum strength and the component maximum strength and heat dissipation onto the board. And so now we have the new relay terminals protruding and we'll solder those on. It would be nice if I had a bit of acid to uh, make solder stick to the traces a little bit better, but I don't have that. When you're soldering, you get your soldering iron good and hot. Get some solder on the, and that's it. So I got in and I got out. You don't wanna take a long time doing this. So I got my soldering iron nice and hot. You can tell, see the light coming on, that's my trigger. So soldering iron's hot, get a little heat on the lead. And that's it. Try not to breathe that smoke, it's not very good for you. You don't want to use so much solder that it bleeds over onto the neighboring trace. I'll now take it up to the stove, plug it in without folding all this up, make sure the stove works. And then when, when it's, uh, when I prove it's working, I'll, I'll actually, you know, permanently put this circuit board back in there. I just don't want to flex these traces anymore than I need to. Given that was flux cord solder, I probably should wash that off, the uh, extra flux with some alcohol or something. I may do that. And uh, yep, there we go. Okay, so I've temporarily put the board back in the uh, 
in, in the oven here. I've connected the wires up along here and then put that one uh, big connector in the back, plugged it in. Uh, oh, and, and by the way, to kind of, uh, you know, support this, those wires are supporting this board, but this part wanted to fall open. So I've put a little, uh, you know, just twist tie to hold it up just temporarily. Bake. 350 uh, and then start right if you don't touch anything after that it starts so preheat an oven or shown and that's been lit for or going for four or five seconds and do a little yeah I don't know if you can hear that but the spit test it's uh it's uh doing that so that's on and we're just gonna let that let that go. So unlike before where really the burner never got hot, red hot like that, it would uh, cut in and cut out, but wouldn't stay lit. And of course, once it gets up to temperature, you'll expect it to cut in and out. But for now it's staying right on red hot and it's probably still got the preheat light lit. Yeah, and it does. So we'll just let that go a little longer. Okay, so I came back into the workshop a few minutes later and uh, noticed the element was not glowing red anymore and um, I checked around the back and the preheat light, light was off and now I hear some relays clicking again so it's probably oh and the oven light went out so I guess that means it's ready to go the bake light is lit oven and preheater out so yeah ready to roll okay so I put the back on and uh, it went on okay and then I realized uh, after I put the top on doesn't look right. The fins in the back face up and out, and the fins on the top faced up and in. And of course, you want the heat to come out the back and dissipate outside of the, of the appliance. So I knew this was on backwards and flipped it around and put it on the right way. And of course, there's a label, so obviously that's the right side out. The, uh, the only other piece I have to do is put the uh, wiring diagram that came with the appliance back in its little, little pouch there, and then this project will be done. So that's how you diagnose and replace a bad relay on the circuit board that controls the bake element and the broil element would be the same diagnosis. Okay, good luck with your do-it-yourself projects. If you like mine.